Good morning, learners. Uh, my name is Mutsenya Nilitina. I am uh, the subject advisor for physical sciences, and I'm also responsible for technical sciences in the Karik district. Uh, today, we are going to be dealing with um, uh, technical sciences for grade 12. And the topics that we will be looking at today are electrostatic or um, elect elasticity as well as hydrostatics. Uh, so those are the topics that we will be dealing with uh, today. Uh, but uh, before we, we start, what I've noticed is that uh, the two topics, elasticity and uh, hydrostatics, they require a lot of um, uh, conversions from one unit to another unit and sometimes these conversions um, give us um, a, a lot of problems uh, when we have to convert. In fact there's a little bit of confusion when one has to convert so we need to, to practice a lot and see if we can be able to eventually get it. So what I'm going to try to do is to start with conversions um, we will look at conversions maybe as quickly as we can and see if we can be able to um, to be comfortable with them so that when we go and apply them in, in the topics that we'll be dealing with, then we can be able to, to use them without having to confuse confusions and the theory that we will be dealing with. So uh, as for conversions, I've uh, come up with uh, this kind of a table that perhaps can help us to do our conversions. Uh, as you can see here, we have uh, the units milli, centi, densi, meter, deca, hecto, and kilo. So this can stand for millimeters, centimeters, decimeters, uh, uh, meters, decameters, hectometers, or kilometers. They can also stand for milligram, centigram, decigram, and so on and so forth, or kilogram. Uh, so these are just the basic uh, units that can help us to deal with the various conversions that we can come across in our calculations. So this um, table just says to us, if you are looking, I think, at the meter, which is um, the most common uh, unit that we are dealing with, uh, it says that if you are looking at the smaller units which make up a meter, then you actually move to the right and you count the number of zeros that you have. In other words, what we can say is that one meter is made up of one zero 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 uh, millimeters. In other words, one meter is made up of a thousand uh, millimeters. So you just count from left to right to that unit which you are looking at. One meter will be made up of a hundred uh, centimeters, starting from there. One meter will be made up of 10 decimeters. Um, in, in, therefore, if we, we, we use this table, we can easily uh, see that um, uh, to move from uh, millimeters to meters, how many millimeters make one meter? You just then count the number of zeros that you have there. It's one and three zeros, which is a thousand. We will get into that as well. But if you are looking at a smaller unit, say for example, how many meters are in a millimeter, then you count from the, uh, you count from the right to the left. So you'd say that uh, one millimeter is made up of zero, 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 one uh, 
meters and 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 uh, I think I will be able to explain that better if I I write down so if for example we say um, one millimeter or, or from what I said earlier converting from millimeters to meters we can say one meter is equal to because we are getting to one meter here then how many millimeters will make one meter then we just count from left to right and then we have one zero 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 one zero 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 which is equal to a thousand millimeters now if we have to write this in scientific notation then we will say that one meter is equal to one times ten notice that if we put a comma here then we are going to have one two three in other words it will be one times ten to the power three uh, millimeters so if you want to know how many millimeters are there in one meter then you will count from left to to right if you want to know how many meters are there in one millimeter then you count from left to from right to left so if we say one millimeter in this case one millimeter will be equal to we count from the meter because we want the number of meters that are there in one millimeter then you count one two three four you write down those zeros one two three and then you have four one two three four then you put your uh, comma there that means that one millimeter will be made up of if we write this in scientific notation it will be one times ten now because we are moving this uh, comma here then we can count the number of uh, uh, decimal places we have to move it in order for it to be equivalent to that which is one two three so it will be because we are now moving to the left it would be negative three or minus three meters so one millimeter will be equal to uh, one times ten to the minus three uh, meters so this is how that table can 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 help us you you can go on to say if maybe you were going to look at um, kilometers and meters then one kilometer will be made up of how many meters so you can see that to move from meters to kilometers we can say one kilometer one kilometer will be equal to if we look at that table we have one followed by three zeros so one kilometer will be one followed by three um, uh, zeros uh, meters in other words that will be one kilometer will be a thousand uh, meters so we can also write it in a scientific notation and say one kilometer is equal to one uh, times ten to the power three uh, meters and if we have to convert from uh, kilometers to meters then we can say one meter is equal to now you will be counting from uh, kilometers you'll just write down the number of uh, digits you have there which is going to be zero 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 one and you just put your your um, comma there so that gives you and this will be kilometers so that gives you if we write it in scientific notation it will be one times ten to the power minus three uh, kilometers so you can use this table in that 
particular way. If you want to know how many um, uh, centimeters uh, make up one meter, then you will notice that a hundred centimeters, counting from left to right, a hundred centimeters give you one meter. But if you um, want how many meters are there in one centimeter, then it will be uh, 0, 0,01 um, um, meters uh, will be equal to one centimeter. So I think uh, you just need to try and practice with, with this uh, table to see how you convert. Uh, you will also notice that when we talk about pressure, you can also talk in terms of kilopascals or in the case in the case of pressure, then instead of a meter there, you will have a pascal. So kilopascal will be a thousand uh, pascals. So in that way, you can be able to use that. A, a kilogram will be made up of a thousand uh, uh, grams. So you can re replace this depending on uh, what quantity you are um, of physical quantity you are actually measuring. So this can be a, 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 a useful tool that you can use uh, in, your, in your calculations. I would like to say maybe initially, as it also confuses me sometimes because I have uh, um, used it a long time back, uh, what you need to do is just to practice uh, using it until you feel comfortable that if I have to move from one unit to another unit, this is what I can do. If I have to move from one unit to uh, the other unit, this is what I can do. So with, with practice, you will be able to see that uh, the table can assist you a lot. Uh, I want also to uh, maybe do a little bit of, of, of mathematics here as it, it, um, the, this topic really uh, requires some mathematics. You will see that from these relationships that we, we have um, uh, established here, if we start with the first one, you, 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 you can also, you know, once you, you are familiar with that table and you are comfortable with that, uh, you can also work it out, like for example, if you are given that one, because that now will be your, your um, can I say, your standard for conversion. You know that one millimeter or one meter is equal to one times 10 to the power three uh, millimeters. Supposing you are asked then how many meters are there in one millimeter. Now notice here that we want the number of meters in one millimeter, but we know that one meter is made up of one times 10 to the power, minus, uh, to the power three millimeters. So you can put an X under the the, the the quantity that you want to find. In other words, you want to find how many meters will there be. On the right hand side here, you will put the same units. One meter is equal to one times 10 to the power three millimeters. Therefore, if you are given one millimeter, then how many meters will that be? So here, I think this is the skill that you have learned in mathematics also that you can simply cross multiply. I want to do this first using units and then we can uh, try and use it without units in, in order to speed up the process. But what I want us to do now is just to get to see how uh, uh, useful this can be. And then once you are able to use it, you understand how uh, to use it, then you can just use uh, some simple methods or uh, shortcuts to be able to get uh, your answers quickly. So in this case, we want uh, x 
by cross multiplication then we will multiply 1 uh, times 10 to the power 3 let's write millimeters multiply that by x then that will be equal to 1 multiplied by 1 so let's write it as 1 meter multiplied by 1 millimeter so because we want x there then we will divide on the left hand side by 1 times 10 to the uh, power 3 and divide on the right hand side by 1 uh, by 1 times 10 to the power 3 so this will be 1 meter multiplied by 1 millimeter divided by 1 times 10 to the power 3 millimeters now you'll see that because we have the same units there the millimeters are going to cancel out and then our x now becomes 1 divided by 1 times 10 to the power 3 and the unit that we have there will be meters remember we were saying how many meters are there in one millimeter so our x gives us the value in in meters so if you like you will check uh, that uh, 1 divided by 1 times 10 to the power 3 is actually the same as 1 times 10 to the power minus 3 meters. So what can we say? 1 millimeter is equal to 1 times 10 to the power minus 3 meters. Now let's just check if what we are saying is true. Remember we using the table we 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 said that one millimeter is equal to a uh, one times ten to the power minus three meters so you can see that these two answers um, are, are the same we can follow the same argument as we, we, we have said to say if you have one kilometer being equal to a thousand meters being equal to let's write it again as one kilometer is equal to one times ten to the power three meters supposing you are asked how many meters will be there in let's say two kilometers just for a um, simplicity case two kilometers now you see we are putting the kilometers on the same side of the equal sign and then we want how many meters will be there in a uh, two kilometers so that will be our our x so what 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 do we do we cross multiply i will also use units in this case um, to say our x then will be one kilometer multiplied by x is equal to this times that two multiplied by can i say one times 10 to the power three meters okay now I forgot to put the unit here, two kilometers. Let's put two kilometers multiplied by, let me put it in brackets, it doesn't matter, by one times 10 to the power three meters. What I just want to show here is that those units will cancel out two kilometers multiplied by one times 10 to the power three meters we divide because we want to remain with x we divide by one kilometer now you will see that the kilometers are going to cancel so x must be in in meters our uh, value that we want to calculate is two times uh, one which is two times ten to the power 
three meters. And if, if we were to use what we have used today, we would therefore say that if one kilometer is a thousand meters, it makes sense to say that um, two kilometers will be equal to uh, 2,000 uh, meters. We can use uh, various examples, and I think you can also try to, 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 to you know, come up with your own examples. But then let's use this very same example now without using uh, units so that it becomes easier. So in, in, in other words, if you were to use this, but now uh, leaving out the units so that you can um, actually do it much quicker, then you would say if one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters, which is one times 10 to the power three meters, then you are asked how many meters would be there in two kilometers, then you put that as your x. So notice that your x then will have the same unit as what is placed under, because on this side you have the same units. So yours is just to cross multiply without now uh, bringing in the units, and then multiply x by 1, and then you get x is equal to multiply 2 by 1 is 2 multiplied by 1 times 10 to the power 3. Um, so, so that gives you uh, 2 times 10 to the power 3. And your unit becomes, because x is under the same side as the uh, meters, then your answer will be a uh, meter. So you can see that this uh, two answers are the same, and it's much easier if you do that. So by cross multiplication, you can simply uh, put the same units on the, the same side, and then you calculate for the one that you are looking uh, for. This is what we could have done with the, the millimeters and meters. If you say one meter is equal to 1 times 10 to the power 3 millimeters. Then we asked how many meters will be one equal to 1 millimeter. The millimeters are placed on one side. The meters will be on the other side. So our x here must have a unit of, of meters. So you simply cross multiply. And then you have x times 1 comma, sorry, 1 times 10 to the power 3 multiplied by x will be equal to 1 times 1. So you ignore the units in this case. Then your x will be equal to 1 over 1 times 10 to the power 3. And then that is equal to 1 times um, 10 to the power minus 3. And what will be your units? Because this x is on the left-hand side where you have me meters, then it will say to you that one millimeter is equal to one times ten to the power minus three meters, which is what we came up with earlier. So in this way, you can be able to to convert from one unit to another unit. In this particular example, we are using uh, the units of length. Uh, we can use um, mass as well as other units, as we will see as we uh, go in to uh, today's discussion of 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 um, of uh, technical science. Those those topics that we said we will be dealing with, which are elasticity and hydrostatics. Uh, uh, while we are still here, perhaps. We can also look at another important uh, conversion. That conversion will be the conversion of area. Sometimes we have a, a challenge 
when we have to convert uh, areas. And um, one way we could um, do this is just to draw a unit uh, although I put it that way, but I can say it's it's a square where one side is let's say one unit and the other side is one unit. Now um, let's say for example we say this is one centimeter in length and that is one centimeter in length. You know that area is equal to length times breadth. Therefore, area in square centimeters will be given by one centimeter multiplied by one centimeter. That would give you one centimeter squared or one square centimeter. Now, supposing you are asked to calculate the area of this um, um, shape, which we would refer to as a square, in meters. That is where now your conversion should uh, come in. If we say one centimeter, you just convert on the same. One centimeter, if we get to our um, table there. Remember we said in meter squared, so our units here should be meters and there should be meters as well. So if we go back to our table there, we want, remember now we have centimeters. So we want to know how many meters are there in one centimeter. So we'll be counting from the left. So one uh, meter will be 0 0.01 cent. Um, one centimeter will be equal to 0 0.01 meters. So here one centimeter will be equal to 0 0.01 meters. That will also be... 0, 0,01 meters. And if you want to simplify that by writing it in standard uh, form or in scientific notation, then this will be equivalent to uh, 1 times 10 to the power uh, minus 2. And that will be equal to 1 times 10 to the power minus 2 in meters. Remember it is still the same area but now you are converting it from square centimeters to square meters. So once you have done that then you will see that the area now in square meters will be length times breadth which will be 1 times 10 to the power minus 2 multiplied by 1 times 10 to the power minus 2. And remember this are meters. So in, in square meters, now when you multiply this, you are going to get 1 multiplied by, remember when you, your, your, your base is the same um, and you just at the indices, so it's negative 2 plus negative 2, that gives us 10 to the power negative 4 square meters. And this can be your conversion or conversion factor. You can say that, you can therefore say that um, one square centimeter is equal to 1 times 10 to the power minus 4 square meters.
Now, if you want to convert, so you see now that is where the, the conversion that I, I, I did uh, earlier is important. If you want to convert meter squared to centimeter squared, then you will notice that if you are saying one centimeter squared is equal to that, then if you want one meter squared, how many centimeters squared will, will that be? You simply uh, cross multiply and you will say 1 times 10 to the power minus 4 x is equal to uh, 1 uh, times 1, of course. Therefore, your x will be 1 um, over 1 times 10 to the power uh, negative 4. And this, of course, if you remove the division line, will be 1 times 10 to the power 4. But what is that? The unit should be, because x is in on the same side as cent square centimeters, will be in square centimeters. So what this tells us is that one square meter is equal to one times 10 to the power four square centimeters. So you can be able to use this as your conversion factor, or you can use that as your conversion factor. We will be dealing with area uh, somewhere. So if we know these conversions, then it can be easy for us to deal with uh, the calculations without really making um, a lot of, 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 of mistakes. So you can work from here. If one square meter is equal to one times 10 to the power of four square centimeters, how many square meters or how many centimeter squares would be, say for example, two uh, square meters. Then you can go on with your calculations using a gross multiplication. And you will see that uh, one, two square meters will therefore be equal to, your x here will be equal to two times 10 to the power four but we are saying centimeter squared because our x is on the same side as that. So if you use that as your conversion factor, it doesn't matter what other quantity you have to be given, then you can put whatever quantity is required uh, on the correct side and then you, you calculate the, the other quantity. I hope this uh, makes some sense and, 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 and probably will, will help us in our calculations as we, we, we continue. Um, yeah, let, let's, let's leave it at area, but you can still use the same argument for volume as well. You can still use the same argument for volume as well. that you have with, with volume, you will just have another side, which is the height there, and then you, you still have one unit, one unit, and if you convert that, that centimeter, you convert it to meter, and that one to meter, and then the height, you convert it to meters as well, and then you can uh, use the same uh, uh, logic or the same uh, process to work out the volume. I'm not sure if we, we have some calculations on volume um, uh, here, but if we come across that, maybe we will uh, have to come back to this and, and do that. So basically, uh, this is what I thought can assist us in, in, in doing our calculations so that, you know, knowing how to convert, we can be able to make calculations. Because most of the time we have seen that it's not that uh, learners do not understand a particular problem or they cannot solve a particular problem, but they have a problem when they have to convert 
uh, uh, units. And then because of the um, uh, failure to convert units correctly, then they also, that translates also to them being unable to get uh, the correct answer. Or maybe full marks if we were, we were to say that. Uh, I think um, with this having been done, we can be able then to uh, look at what we are uh, 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 supposed to do for, for today. But uh, before then, I think we should then take a, a short break. Um, I would request that you, you, you practice uh, with this kind of conversions. Use different units, use different quantities to different uh, physical factors, like you can use mass, you can use um, uh, area, as I've indicated. You can use the force also, because you can have a newton, you can have a kilonewton, uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. So maybe we can take a short break uh, while you also try to think about this and also maybe try to, to practice on it. Uh, let's make it just uh, five minutes and then we'll come back. Uh, welcome back, uh, learners. As I've indicated, we will start now with uh, elasticity, which is uh, also part of uh, mechanics. And you'll notice that here I'm uh, using one of the textbooks. Um, so I will be um, dealing with some of the examples in the textbook as well as um, solving some of the problems or exercises uh, with you. But I think the important idea here is for us to be able to understand uh, the concepts and also how to deal with the uh, with the problems. So um, what we expect to you to know uh, from uh, this topic or chapter in, 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 in uh, elasticity, we expect you to be able to get a, a broad understanding, knowledge relating to what a deforming force is. So you should be able to define a deforming force you should be able to define a restoring force. You should understand the similarities or differences between the two. You should understand what elasticity is, and you should also know what stress and strain are. And we will also be able to do some calculations based on this concept, stress and strain. And then lastly, we'll look at uh, Hooke's law. So this is what we will be uh, looking at uh, in this chapter, and that is what we expect you to, to do. Now, um, you, you will notice that uh, on el elasticity, um, here they say so far we have learned about only one effect of a force on an object, and that is in the previous uh, topics or chapters where you were dealing with motion. So uh, uh, one of the effects of, of force on an object would be to change the speed of an object or um, cause uh, an object to move or um, a moving object to, to increase its speed or decrease its speed. However, uh, changing the speed of an object is just one effect. There are some other effects that a force can have of an object, and these are some of the effects that a force has on an object. It can cause a stationary object to move, which is what uh, you learned in uh, motion. Uh, it can stop a moving object that you also have uh, learned in motion. Uh, it can change the direction of a moving object. That is a, a topic that you will have done in, in, in motion as well. And then it can also change the shape and size of an object. So this is actually our area of concern in this particular uh, discussions that we are going to have. A, a, a force can change the shape or the size of an object. Example that is given here is squeezing, uh, squeezing a stress ball. You, when you squeeze a stress ball, a stress ball is like a tennis ball 
uh, that you can squeeze, you change its shape as you, you press it in your hand. So although we may think of uh, solids as having a definite shape and volume, uh, it is possible to change the shape and volume. And you have seen that if you take a, a cold drink can and you you squeeze it also like you squeeze a, a tennis ball or a stress ball, then you can shape each, we can change its shape by crushing, sort of crushing it. So a force can sh change the shape of an object or the size of an object in that particular way. And such a force that changes the shape and size of an object is referred to as a deforming force. Um, here they are giving an example of a force exerted on an object hanging on a spring. Um, we can also, like I've given that example of crushing uh, a, a, a cold drink can in, in your hand, that you would be applying a deforming force which changes the shape and uh, that, but here they are using an object hanging on a spring. So they say when squeezed, certain objects have a tendency to regain their shape. Such objects are able to exert a restoring force. So a, a restoring force uh, is a force that actually counteracts the deforming force. A deforming force tries to change the shape of the object, but a restoring force tries to uh, maintain the shape of, or of an object. And that restoring force that is exerted by an object uh, is equal in magnitude to the force that is applied or the deforming force, but it acts in the opposite direction. So a deforming force tries to squeeze the object, but the restoring force tries to uh, can I say expand to, 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 to oppose the deforming force. And so there are some materials that are able to uh, exert this restoring force. And these materials um, are referred to as elastic uh, materials. So in this uh, uh, diagram, you can see that we are saying if we are hanging a mass piece on a spring, the, 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 the weight of the mass spring is exerting a force on the spring and that is a, a deforming force which uh, 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 extends the this, this spring, which elongates the spring. As you can see here, the spring is shorter because there's no mass hanging on it. But once you have a mass hanging on it, then that deforming force uh, causes the spring to increase in length. But to keep this spring, um, uh, in, if we want to say in equilibrium, there must be a force that acts in the opposite direction on the spring, and that is a, a restoring force. Notice that if this uh, mass has to st or stays in the same position or is stationary, then the restoring force uh, by the spring will be equal to the deforming force but they will be acting in opposite directions. So it, the, the restoring force will be equal in magnitude to the deforming force, but it will be acting in the opposite direction. If we are saying the deforming force is acting downwards, then the restoring force will be acting upwards, trying to restore the original shape of, of the spring. So um, the property of a body to regain its original shape such as this uh, spring, when you remove the deforming uh, force, is referred to as elasticity. Um, I will say that at, at this stage, the definitions that we'll be using here are the definitions in the book, but remember that you have been provided with um, uh, terms and definition booklets that um, uh, you can use to, to, to learn the definitions and those uh, including your exam guidelines are the books that or booklets that have, have, have been designed for you uh, with the appropriate definitions that you can use uh, in your examination so uh, i would request or encourage you 
to read this um, terms and definition books as well as the exam guidelines to learn the definitions rather than take them uh, strictly from the book. So here what I will do is try to explain what these concepts are so that uh, perhaps they, they make sense to us. So the property of a body uh, like this spring to retain or to regain its original uh, shape and size when you remove the deforming force then we refer to that as its elasticity so that is elasticity and um, we classify objects uh, with respect to their elasticity into uh, two categories there will be what we refer to as perfectly elastic bodies and this a perfectly elastic body will be a body that will regain its original shape and size completely when the deforming force is revo removed then we say it is a uh, perfectly elastic and of course we are saying perfect elasticity is an approximation of the real world um, um, like uh, quartz fiber quartz fiber is 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 used in guitar strings so those are perfectly elastic uh, examples or close to perfectly elastic and also phosphorus bronze which is used in springs and cables so this uh, spring will be made from a, a, a phosphorus bronze which which is an alloy so those would be examples of a perfectly elastic body. A, a perfectly plastic body will be a body that does not show a tendency to regain its original shape and size when the deforming force is removed. So once you deform this object, the object is not going to regain its original shape and size. Uh, it remains deformed. And uh, if you look at wax, you look at a uh, putty, you look at, at clay, for example, this will be a, a, a perfectly plastic uh, bodies. And in reality, there are no perfectly elastic uh, uh, or perfectly plastic bodies as we have indicated earlier. And uh, actual bodies lies between the two extremes. So in, in, in practice, you don't really have what you would say this is perfectly elastic and this is uh, perfectly a uh, plastic but you have a mixture of those or they lie uh, between those two extremes um, another concept that we need to know about is stress uh, indicated by uh, that uh, symbol uh, sigma refers to the internal restoring force per unit cross-sectional area of a body. So uh, we say stress is equal to the internal restoring force uh, which of course could be also referred to as the stress acting on a unit area of a body. So stress because it's, 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 it's um, a force acting on a unit uh, area or cross-sectional area is measured in pascals. So the unit of uh, uh, stress is a pascal and it is also um, uh, represented by Newton per square meter. I think it makes sense uh, to say that stress is equal to force divided by area. So if you can look at that force divided by area, the unit of force is a Newton divided by area which is square meter so um, I think based on what we we said when we were uh, we were we were doing the when we were doing the conversions if we are saying stress is a force over area. Now the force has a unit of newtons or newton and, and the area has a, a unit of meter uh, squared or square meter. 
So if you like, this is the same as 1 times 10, uh, can I say, 1, uh, one meter per uh, uh, one meter square. In other words, then you can uh, write this as Newton multiplied by meter raised to the power minus 2. This is the same as 1 over meter squared. So 1 over meter squared is the same as 1 times um, 1 times meter raised to the power minus 2, which is the same as meter minus 2. So that, that, that unit of stress is Newton per square meter, which is also equal to a Pascal. So that is what we have in in the book there, so that we 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 are not uh, confused. So that is why we say that a uh, stress in me is measured, or the unit of that can be newton per square meter, or we can say that is a Pascal. On the other hand, strain is defined as the ratio of change in dimension to the original dimension. So um, if you stretch that spring, the change, say in length of that spring, divided by the original length of the spring will be uh, the, the strain on that spring. Notice that then that change in length over the original length because we are talking about the same unit, the same unit, the length. The length here, if it's measured in meters, will be a meter on top there. It will be a meter uh, on the uh, denominator. So the meters are going to cancel out. And therefore, a strain does not have a, a unit. We can say that a strain is equal to change in length over uh, the original length. So the unit of length, the change just means the, the final length minus the initial uh, length. So the unit will be meter divided by the original length, which will be a meter. So these meters cancel out. So there will no, no, not be a unit. So if you like, then uh, you will have a, a number or one day without uh, the units because the units cancel out. So that is why a strain does not have a unit. Now let's look at this um, example. I will read that and then I will try to write down uh, the quantities as, as I, I, I read the question. Then we will see, um, I will switch on to where I have written so that you can see what I have written and then we can be able to, to solve that problem. I think that will be the approach I will use uh, so that we can be able to, to see what is happening. So this, um, a uh, question here says a steel wire with uh, which is 10 meters long and by 10 meters long there we mean that the length of that is is um, the length of that is 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 10 meters so the length of that wire is 10 meters and it is two millimeters in diameters. So the diameter is two millimeters. And then it is attached to a ceiling and a weight here, the weight of an object is actually the force um, of gravity acting on the mass of that object, which is um, 200 uh, newtons. 
then they say this weight is attached to the end of that um, a wire or steel wire. Now they say what is the applied stress. In other words, you should calculate the stress. What we want to calculate is the stress. I think here we should we should we should notice that we have a wire of a certain length and in this case they are saying the length of that wire is 10 meters then the diameter if you take the cross sectional area of that the diameter of that uh, Um, a wire is, is 2 millimeters. So D is equal to 2 millimeters. I'm just trying to make this visual so that you can see what is uh, happening. And then they are saying on that wire hangs a, a, f a mass with a force of 200 newtons acting on it. Now you are actually asked to calculate the stress. And from the formula, that we were given, we know that the stress should be the force over the area. Force is already in newtons, so we are, we are happy. The length is in meters, but the diameter is given in millimeters. So we need to convert this diameter to meters. Now you see now, that is where now our convention conversion comes in. So we know that if we have to convert uh, meters to, uh, sorry, millimeters to meters, one meter will be equal to millimeters. One meter will be equal to we have 1,000 uh, meters. So one millimeter will be equal to 1,000 meters, which is uh, uh, one meter will be equal to 1,000 millimeters. That therefore means that one meter is equal to one times 10 to the power three millimeters. So we want to change the millimeters to meters. So this is our conversion factor. One meter is equal to a thousand millimeters. So we have two millimeters. And remember that is the diameter. But we want to change this diameter, sorry, this, uh, to change the millimeters into meters. So notice that our x this time uh, is on the side of meters. On the side of millimeters, we have the same uh, units. So we can say our diameter now in meters, which is x, will be, by cross multiplication, will be 2 times 1, which is 2 divided by 1 times 10 to the power 3. Then our diameter in meters will now be equal to, let's work and that out. Actually, it's actually going to be 2 times 10 to the power minus uh, 3 uh, meters. But remember that this 2 times 10 to the power minus 3 is just the diameter. What do we have to do? We 
we have to calculate the area, but this is because it is um, uh, a cylinder, or you can say it's a circle, the cross-sectional area is a circle, then the area of a circle is given by A is equal to pi uh, radius squared. Now, remember, we need to convert this diameter into radius, but radius is actually half of the diameter. So half of the diameter, if you like, you can say radius is equal to half of the diameter. In other words, that our radius will now be 2 times 10 to the power minus 3 divided by, by 2, which will give us 1 times 10 to the power minus 3 meters. Now we have done the the uh, required conversion, first changing the radius, sorry, the diameter to radius so that we can be able to substitute here and then we can be able to calculate the area because we would be having the radius. But the important thing as well is that our diameter should be converted from millimeters to meters. And in so that is why I said these conversions are very important. So um, uh, how do we go about it? Let's work out uh, the area there is pi, which is 3,14, multiplied by uh, the radius, which is 1 times 10 to the power uh, minus 3 meters. But that has to be squared. So we can work that out uh, using our calculator. It gives me three comma one four times ten to the power minus six. So this is area in square meters. So we we have the force, it's there, and then we have calculated the area from the diameter is there, then we can therefore calculate the stress, which is force over area, and then that will be 200 newtons divided by 3,4 times 10 to the power minus 6 square meters. That should be 3,14, not 3,4. Exponent minus 6. So it gives us 6,37 times 10 to the power 7. Remember the unit of uh, stress there will be pascals. I think we are happy with this. The important thing for us is we are given the diameter, but we have to calculate the area. So so um, we must first convert the diameter into or we, we have any way, some way, to convert the diameter into the radius because we know the relationship between the diameter and the radius. And the radius is half 
of the diameter. But the important thing to remember is that the SI unit for uh, um, uh, length or uh, uh, distance will be uh, meters. So the diameter, because it's a cross-sectional length of that uh, 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 wire, we will refer to it, uh, sorry, because it's the, the, the length of that or cross-sectional length of that, then we convert it into meters. So then we convert that to meters, and once we have converted it to meters, we can then di divide the diameter by two so that we get the radius. So once we have the radius, then we can be able to calculate the area. The area is given by pi radius squared, and then we substitute in that, and then we are able then to use the formula that we have to, to for, for stress, which is a force over area, and then we divide the as uh, appropriate, and we get our um, answer in Pascals. Remember this Pascal is equal to a Newton per square meter. So, so the idea here is for us to be able, not necessarily to, um, you know, just to do the mathematics and calculate in that. We should know the process. What are we supposed to do? Uh, we have to convert the, 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 the diameter there to meters so that, the, or the, yes, because it's, it's part of the length. So that is what is required. Um, I think this question actually would need us, if, if maybe, because we are given the length of, of that, but it appears we we don't have to we are not going to use that length anyway, but because here we are just required to calculate the stress on the object. So for the stress, what we need is the force, which is given there. We we need the area, which we can calculate using the the diameter of the 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 wire. So I think that is. Um, uh, in a nutshell, how that example uh, looks like. Okay, there we have the 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 we have the the answer there. I don't know. Maybe something went wrong there, because it should be the same the same answer as that. Um, okay, example 2.2 .2 says, if the 200 Newton load in the previous example causes the wires to stretch by 3,08 millimeters, what is the strain? I, I think that is what I was wondering about. Why, didn't they, why did they give us the length of, 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 of the wire when they don't ask anything about the strain. But now they are telling us that um, as one of the given information, they say it causes the wire to stretch by, uh, that means the change in length will now be equal to 3,08 millimeters. You, now you see we, we still have to, to, to work with that. And then we are uh, uh, asked to calculate the strain. I will, I will use this. Remember, we are given the length of the, the original length of the wire. We are given the change in length. Now my paper does not fit in, in in the in the in the in the camera. We are given the length, the change in length, and we are asked to calculate the the strain. So I will just quickly write down this information. The length is equal to ten meters. Uh, the change in length is equal to uh, three comma zero eight. Uh, 
now it is millimeters. I think that is where uh, these questions catch us because now we have to convert this to, so they want us to find uh, the stress. We have to convert this millimeters to meters. I think from what we we learned here that one meter, one meter is one times ten to the power three millimeters. So we can just use that. Three comma zero eight will be three comma zero eight times ten to the power three. Uh, did we say ten to the power three? We are converting it to know it should be to the power minus three meters. because we are converting it to, to meters. You will try to use the same conversion that, or uh, uh, argument that we used to, to get to 3,08 times 10 to the power uh, minus 3 meters. So once we have converted that, so we have the same unit meter, we have the same unit meter there. Therefore, the stress will be given by the change in length over uh, the original length of that which is um, change in length is 3,08 times 10 to the power minus 3. We divide that by 10. So that will give us, um, can I? And I put it here, 3,08 times 10 to the power minus 4. You can work that out and find out if it is uh, correct. Or perhaps we can also check in, in the book there if uh, they Remember now that uh, this does not have unit because the uh, strain does not have unit because you have meters divided by meters. So the meters cancel out. So there won't be a unit for that. I hope we are together. Um, I will just leave this for you to think about and define them. Remember that um, in, in examinations as well and also in solving problems, you have to be able to understand um, how to define certain uh, terms. And by being able to define these terms, you are able also to apply um, this uh, um, um, definitions in solving uh, problems. So uh, you can try to do it, uh, answer the, the question, try to define on your own, and then go back to the terms and definitions or to your um, exam guideline. Check whether you've got the definition correct. If you have not, then you try again, but I would encourage you to uh, while doing that to um, to to write the definitions don't just uh, try to memorize them or just think about them write because there is a coordination between um, the brain and the the eye and the hand so as you write you tend to uh, to remember more what what you you learn so write down the definition, check whether it is correct, go back and write it down, check whether it is correct, and the more you do that, repeating that several times, you will be able to get it right. And when it comes out in the examination or when somebody asks you about the definition, then it will be easy for you to remember, especially if you try to write it, because the moment you try to write it, you will find that that information that you have uh, just comes 
uh, back and you can be able to write that, then you can be able to define to uh, someone. Uh, I would also like us to do question two here in this activity 2.1. Uh, let me give you a few minutes to just um, uh, read through and then you see if you can be able to, to do it. It says a nylon fishing line that has a diameter of 0 0.36 millimeters is being pulled by a fish with a force of 20 newtons. So for this one, I think as, 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 as a way I am of, of, of answering questions, uh, your, your uh, teachers should really have um, shown you this recipe that uh, it is also important for you to write down the information that is given in the question so that you identify the, 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 the quantities and then you are able to check which quantity is, is required uh, of you to calculate. Then it becomes easy for you to even choose the formula, even though you are given this formula in, 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 in the data sheet. But if you know the quantities and you know the topic you are dealing with, it is easy for you to work out and find out uh, what what um, quantity is, 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 is being uh, required. And then you can easily uh, select the formula for that. Um, so this question, I will also write um, the information there. Uh, it says a nylon fishing line that has a diameter. So we are given the diameter is equal to 0, 0,36 millimeters. Now you see that these uh, quantities are given in, 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 in millimeters or sometimes in centimeters, so you have to be able to convert this to meters. So um, the diameter of that is 0 0.36 millimeters. It's being pulled by a fish with a force of uh, 20, so the force is 20 newtons. Uh, 2.1 requ uh, requires you to calculate the, the stress. Two point two says the original length is twenty five meters, and after pulling the twenty newton load, the fishing line stretched by, so it stretched two which means that gives us the change in length, which is 20. It stretched to that length. It, that is not the change in length. That is the final, um, um, it is the final uh, length, 25 comma 055 meters. So that is not the change length, but it is the final length. So the change in length will actually be that final length minus the initial length, which is 25 meters. We will, we will check that. Now they say you should calculate the strain. Then 2.3 says if a fishing line of the same length, but twice the diameter, so the diameter is two is is doubled was used what would be the stress caused by a 10 newton so they want stress caused by a 10 newton force perhaps we'll get back to to this uh, a question as well so let's let's just quickly see if we can be able to to do that question I hope I will be able to remember what um, the question required.
Okay, 2.1, I said it required you to calculate the stress, so you don't know the stress there. That is what you want. And then question 2.3 uses 2.3. Is that 2.3? No, 2.2 gives you this information, and you have to calculate the uh, strain. And then the last question tells you that the diameter of the fishing rod is two ti times the original diameter and the 10 newton force x on that so you must check the stress the stress that is a uh, cost by uh, that is uh, experienced by that uh, road or by the fishing line or fishing line yes so let's see if we can be able to do this i think with the information that we have we can be able to calculate that So the th first thing that we need to do here is remember that uh, for stress, I think this is similar to the one that we, we did. Stress is given by force over area. And here we are given the diameter. So that means if area is equal to pi radius squared, we must uh, convert that diameter to to radius which we will have to divide by 2 so radius is equal to 0 0.36 divided by 2 remember this is in millimeters so this is going to be 0 0.18 uh, millimeters now we have to change this millimeters into meters which is going to be 0 0.18 times 10 to the power uh, minus 3 meters. I think that is the conversion that, that we used. So, so what do we do? Um, we can calculate the area from that. It will be pi times radius squared, which will be one com sorry, 3 comma 1 4 times the radius 0 0.18 times 10 to the power minus 3 that squared then we must find that area I just want to check that. Um, I'll check if this is correct. I get 1,02 times 10 to the power minus 7. So this will be meters squared because it's the area. Then, then um, our stress then will be F which is um, the force is 20 newtons please take it from the 20 newtons we are substituting over a uh, 1 comma 02 times 10 to the power minus 7 uh, that should give us
one comma nine six times ten to the power eight. Please check if this is correct. Um, that would be Pascal's. Just check if that is correct. But we can also check because we have it um, in the book. The I think that would be correct. Please, if if I've, I've I've messed up something, they you will check with me. I think the important thing is for us to be able to 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 to, to follow the process to know what uh, we have to do. Remember that when you do calculations, you start with the formula, then you substitute. Then hence why I use this arrow. I think it is a, a bit a bad way of doing things. But remember, you start with the formula, you get a mark for that, and then you substitute and you will get a mark for the substitution and also for the answer with unit. So please remember that that is how you should do as we have done in this particular case. So just check, maybe I could have made a mistake with the calculation and that is, um, and that is normal and it's human. So if I've made a mistake, please uh, uh, just check and, 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 and correct that. Uh, the second question, says um, the original length was 25 meters. The change in length, because the final length is 25,055 meters, the change in length would be the difference between the two, which would give us a, a 0 0,55 meters. Then uh, to calculate the to calculate the strain, we have change in length over the original length. Now our change in length is equal to zero comma five five. Um, now I'm writing outside the the camera because I'm trying to fit in the. And so it's 0 0,5, 0 0,055 divided by uh, the original length, which is 25. Then you can work out the, the answer there, please. This gives me... Two comma two times ten to the power minus three. I think I've set my calculator to 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 uh, scientific notation, and and then this would be the stress does not have unit. Uh, sorry, the, the the strain does not have units. So this would be the correct uh, answer there. I don't know if I would. At a third decimal, then it would give us two comma two zero times ten to the power minus three. So if you are not using a scientific cal uh, sorry, uh, you have not used the scientific notation on your calculator, I think that would give us zero comma um, zero two two. Yes. Um there, there, there you are. I think the, the last question is, is a bit interesting in that it, it says that if the diameter was twice the that one the original one. So that means the radius would actually be equal to the diameter. Am I right? Because we are saying the diameter is equal to two times the original diameter, which was zero comma three six. But if it is the diameter there, you will still have to find the radius. The radius will the radius will therefore be half of the diameter. 
so it would be half of 2 times 0, 0,36. I think you see that this will cancel out, so the radius will actually be 0, 0,36. Um, uh, is that 0, 0,36? Oh, millimeters again. <laughs> so we have to convert this to meters. Change this to meters, which will give us 0, 0,36 um, times 10 to the power minus 3 meters. Then we use this value to calculate the, the area, and then we can calculate the stress. But here, instead of uh, calculating the, yes, to calculate the stress, we remember that stress uh, is equal to force over area. I think this is already what we have done. So what we need to do is to, uh, we are given the force there, which is 10 newtons. We are given the area. Remember, you have the radius. So you will have the area being pi 3,14 multiplied by um, the ra the radius which is 0, 0,36 times 10 to the power minus 3 but your radius must be squared so work out the answer that you will find there so this is 10 newtons and of course this will be the area which will be square meters so to find we we may not include this units then you can find this your stress will be in in Pascal's work out what the answer is there. I, I, I think now you get the idea or an idea in terms of these conversions. They can be really, 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 really um, uh, confusing because as you work out, you work out a question, sometimes you forget that now the unit is in millimeters and you have to change it to meters. So I think that is where the catch is with this uh, type of questions. So. Uh, what I would uh, encourage you to do is uh, just to open up your mind. Remember that you have to work with uh, SI units. And if that is the case, then you need to uh, identify where you are given a, a unit that is not an SI unit, that you convert it to the SI unit. And basically that is uh, how we could be able to, to solve some of these problems. Um, I think... Uh, that would um, 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 allow us maybe to have another break and then we can see if we can get to Hooke's Law. It looks like there's a lot of uh, work that we have to do. So we'll get to Hooke's Law quickly and then uh, that will be after a break. Let's get another five minutes break and see uh, what we can do. Thank you. Uh, welcome once more learners. Welcome once more learners. Um, we are getting on with our discussion. Now we will be looking at uh, Hooke's Law. Um, From here it says that most uh, materials that possess elasticity in practice remain purely elastic with very small deformations. In other words, if a material is elastic, uh, it, in practice it will um, remain purely elastic with very small deformations. Then the degree of elasticity of a material is determined by two factors, one which we call a modulus and that modulus of elasticity will be uh, explained, which means the amount of force per unit area that is needed to achieve a given amount of deformation. So the modulus of elasticity refers to the amount of force per unit area. So is the force per unit area that is needed to achieve a given amount of deformation. And <coughs> that force per unit area, as you can see, is actually um, 
the stress. A higher modulus typically indicates that the material is harder to deform. The second factor is the elastic limit. Uh, this is the maximum force per unit area stress that can be applied to a body so that it regains its original form completely once the force has been removed. So elastic limit refers to the maximum force that can be applied per unit area that can be applied to a body so that it regains its original form uh, completely once that force uh, has been removed. So Hooke's law states that within the limit of elasticity, stress is directly proportional to strain. And um, this is uh, by definition what uh, Hooke's law uh, looks like. It's, it says within the limit of elasticity. In other words, um, uh, as we have indicated, elastic limit is the maximum force per unit area that it can be applied to a body so that it can, gains its original form completely once the force has been removed. So there is an, a, a point when you are stretching, for example, a spring where a hook slow is not obeyed or where you exceed this maximum force, which is at the elastic limit of a spring. So uh, the, the, the hook slow states that they the, 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 um, within the limit of elasticity, stress is directly proportional to strain. In other words, if we have to write this using symbols and mathematically, we can say that uh, stress is directly proportional to the strain. That is within the limit of elasticity. I just wanted to check. <coughs> Now, by introducing the proportionality constant k, we can get the following equation uh, uh, where we can say stress is equal to a constant multiplied by the strain. And therefore, the constant that k is equal to the stress divided by strain. And this proportionality constant k is called the modulus of elasticity of a material. So the modulus of elasticity of the material is uh, basically equal to this ratio of stress to strain, or the stress divided by the strain. So if we were to look at the spring, just want to check if it is um, here, okay, there, there it is. They are saying, look at that s s s spring that is hanging there. You are uh, applying a force, which is the weight of that, as we explained earlier on, and then the spring is exiting a, 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 an opposing force which restores, or the restoring force, which restores it to its original length, then if that was the rest position of the string, you, by in, of the spring, by in, increasing the force, or by in, um, um, hanging the force, or applying the force on the spring, you are causing an extension, uh, which is changing x. So you, are actually uh, causing that extension to take place. So if you were to measure or to, to measure the change in position there, as we increase the, the, the masses on the spring, then you would be able to get values of change in x or change in length of the spring. And of course, by calculating the strain, which is um, referred to as the change in length, we, we have calculated that the change in length um, divided by the original length, and we plot that against the stress, which is um, uh, the force applied per unit area. Then we find that there is a relationship at the um, 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 at the beginning of this uh, experiment where the 
the stress and the strain form is or the, 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 the relationship between the stress and, and, and the strain, the graph forms a straight line there. And that straight line is where Hooke's law is uh, obeyed, and we refer to that as the elastic uh, region. But when you get to a point where you exceed the elastic limit, then this, the, the, this relationship of a straight line where the stress and the strain are directly proportional uh, is, is, is disobeyed. And that region is what we refer to as the plastic region, where now the spring would have been overstretched and it cannot go back to its original uh, uh, size or length when uh, the, 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 the stress or the force is applied on it. So the region AB in the, is the elastic region where you have Hooke's law being uh, uh, obeyed. The stress is uh, below the elastic limit and Hooke's law is obeyed within that region. The slope of the line AB is then the modulus of elasticity. Remember, a modulus of elasticity K is stress over strain. So the slope there will be the stress divided by strain, which is referred to as that modulus of elasticity, which is K. Now BCD, this area, that is where now the, str the spring has uh, overstretched, will be the plastic region. The stress applied has surpassed the elastic limit which a material can withstand. A permanent deformation starts and Hooke's law is not ob obeyed. If the stress applied is increased, the material will reach a point where it will break. So once you can extend that string, um, 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 beyond its elastic limit, then the spring will uh, no longer be obey or, or, uh, Hooke's law, and therefore there will be a point where it will uh, actually uh, break. I want us to look at um, example Two point three. It says consider a rectangular tie bar with a length of uh, three meters no, I think this one there's a, a problem, a slight problem with this one that I think we 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 will uh, leave for now, otherwise we will have to rephrase some of the statements there when I looked at that question. Perhaps we can look at activity 2.2 .2 and the perhaps let's look at the very first question there. It says a steel bar is a hundred millimeters long with a cross section, square cross section of 20 millimeters. I'm trying to look at, at the, it looks like I, I, I didn't do this one. Let me look at um, uh, activity that activity 2.2, .2, but we look at a question 2. That's the one that I think that I looked at. It says a steel bar is stretched to 280 megapascals. You now this one is it's a big one, megapascal. The modulus of elasticity is 2. 105 gigapascals. The bar has a diameter of 80 millimeters and a length of 240 millimeters. Now it says determine the strain on the steel column. 
the force exerted on the steel column. You, I think here you really need to know how we change this pascals to megapascal. Um, let me first write down the information that we have. The information that we have there, it says a steel bar is stressed to, so that 280 uh, megapascals is the stress. So the stress, um, that is question two, the stress is given by 280 megapascals, that MA is megapascal. So, um, one megapascal is um, actually equal to is equal to one times ten to the power six pascals. So we will use that that. Um, conversion factor to to work out this problem. I will switch on to the camera so that you see what I am writing as soon as I've read the question and tried to write down the relevant information. So it says a steel bar is stressed to 280 megapascals and that is the stress we have provided with that. Then it says the modulus of elasticity is 205. So the modulus of elasticity, remember, is k is equal to 205. They say is gigapascals. Oh, it's 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 a big unit um, or quantity. Uh, one gigapascal is equal to one times ten to the power nine pascals. <clears throat> so we will also use that conversion to <coughs> sorry I'm now <coughs> coughing on the mic sorry for that then it says the bar has a diameter of 80 millimeters the diameter of the bar is 80 millimeters Remember now we are given the diameter there, it means we must convert it to a radius and it is in millimeters. So if we convert it to um, radius, we must divide by two. We'll, I will show that as we go on. And the length of that uh, bar is, the original length is 240 millimeters. So the length is also in millimeters. So what we are supposed to calculate in 2.1 is the strain. Remember strain is, we are supposed to calculate the strain we are also in 2.2 expected to calculate the, the force exerted on the steel column. Perhaps we can be able to now if we talk about the diameter then we should realize that that should be a cylindrical. So that would be the diameter of the cross-sectional area. So the diameter there is given as um, 80 millimeters. 
and that means that the radius will be half of the diameter which will be 40 millimeters remember to calculate the force I think we need that um, then what other information do we have this stress is 280 megapascals and we said 1 megapascal is equal to 1 times 10 to the power 6 pascals so our stress remember we said stress is equal to force over area and then we said uh, the strain is equal to change in L over L so what were we asked to calculate here we are asked to calculate uh, the strain The original length is there. Are we given enough information on this? Oh yes, we are given the modulus of elasticity. So we can calculate E. We are given the modulus of elasticity. And what is the relationship between the modulus of electricity uh, elasticity k is equal to uh, stress over strain do we have the stress yes we have the stress so this quantity we have looks like I'm a bit confused now uh, we have the this stress we have the modulus of um, uh, elasticity then we can calculate E that is what is required there so if we know this formula we can be able to uh, identify which formula we can use to be able to calculate that so so what uh, is it that we need to, to find is the, the strain And we have to change the the stress in megapascals to pascals. The modulus of elasticity from gigapascals to uh, pascals. So I think that is what we need to do. So if um, one megapascal is equal to one times ten to the power six pascals. Then one a, a two hundred and eighty megapascals will be equal to. If we use the conversions as we said earlier, then we just cross multiply and multiply this one by that to get x. So x will actually be 280 multiplied by 1 times 10 to the power 6 and that will be in pascals. So this will be 280 times 10 to the power 6 pascals I think it is easier if we leave it like that then we can do the same with uh, uh, the uh, with K the modulus of elasticity 
1 gigapascal is equal to 1 times 10 to the power 9 pascals. Therefore, we said uh, the modulus of elasticity is 205. Therefore, 205 gigapascals will be equal to uh, 205 times 1 times 10 to the power 9 air pascals, which will be the same as 205 times 10 to the power 9 air pascals. So we are having these quantities in pascals. Then we have to find this. So I think the best or the easiest way for us to do that would be just to substitute in this equation. The modulus is, is 205 in this equation. K is equal to a stress. I am writing it as if it's theta over a strain. But we know that our modulus of elasticity is equal to 205 times 10 to the power 9 pascals. That is equal to our s stress, which is 280 times 10 to the power 6 pascals. That is divided by E. So what we have to calculate is E because we are given these two quantities. So if we cross multiply, our E looks like I'm tired now. Our E is equal to, if you multi cross multiply, then E will be equal to um, 280 times 10 to the power 6 divided by 205 times 10 to the power 9. And remember, if you were to look at the units there, this would be pascals. I'm just putting that for interest's sake because um, we said the strain does not have a, a unit. So you'll see that the pascals cancel out. And whatever answer we get here will give us um, The, the strain without um, units. I'm even writing out, out outside the screen. That's a sign of exhaustion. 280 So what I get here, according to my calculator, which gives me the answer to two decimal places, um, is 1,37 times 10 to the power minus 3. So that gives us the, the strain. I don't like this. It's a question mark, but now it looks like I have um, that squared. So this will be the answer to question 2.1, which said how. So notice in this case, I think this question, um, apart from the conversions, we need to realize that it used the formula for the modulus of elasticity. You are given the stress you are given the modulus, then you have to calculate the, the strain. Then you have to do those conversions. And then, uh, of course, I think because now we are actually looking at, at the strain, which does, not have, which does not have units, you may as well really 
um, uh, just work in 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 kilopascals, but finally you will have to convert uh, your your answer. I think that would still uh, 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 be correct, but I I would prefer that we we convert it to uh, the correct SI units. For you can try perhaps uh, to check if you do not convert it to that, but because uh, the the strain does not have units, I think you can still work with uh, the kilo uh, giga. But 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 then the 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 units must be the same the giga and the the mega you must convert at least one of them to either the mega pascal or the giga pascal so that you have the same unit otherwise if the units are not the same then there's no way in which you can uh, divide that so that is what uh, that question requ requested so the second one requires uh, us to find the the force. It looks like I've forgotten actually what the question would look like. Or it says um, calculate the or determine the force exerted on the steel column. The steel bar is stressed to this. The modulus of elasticity is that. The bar has a diameter of that and a length of that. So they say determine the force exerted on the steel column. So how would we do that? The formula or the relevant formula that we 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 have uh, are given there. The one which has force is this one. We have the stress is given there. Um, we have the diameter of 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 the uh, is that the bar here. So we can calculate the area. So we need to calculate the the stress. So this one is similar to the ones that we have done, really. If we can identify um, um, the, what did I say? We have to calculate the force. This is what we have to calculate. We have the stress is given there. And we have already converted it to uh, pascals. So we have it here. And then we have... The, the area we can calculate because we have the diameter of that and then we can calculate the force using this formula. Let's just see um, how we can we can do it. I don't know how, if the information will still be there. I want to us to start with the area. Remember area is pi radius squared. But the diameter is 80 millimeters and therefore the radius is equal to 40 millimeters. And we said this millimeters, 40 millimeters is equal to 40 times 10 to the power minus 3 meters. I think now you will remember our conversions. So that means the area then will be, we substitute in this equation, the area will then be pi 3,14 multiplied by the radius, which is 40 times 10 to the power minus 3. And remember, we have to square that. So I think if my calculations uh, are correct, we should get 5,024 times 10 to the power minus 3 square meters. That will be our area for that problem. Now we know we have the area, we have um, this, the stress, it is given, we said it is equal to 280 um, times 10 to the power 6 
pascals. So the formula that we have is uh, stress is equal to F over A. Now we have these two quantities. We are supposed to find F. So we can substitute directly into, into this formula to say our stress is 280 times 10 to the power 6 pascals. That is equal to the force that we want to calculate divided by the area, which is 5,024 times 10 to the power minus 3. So by cross multiplication, your F will be equal to this times that, which is 280 times 10 to the power 6 multiplied by 5,024 times 10 to the power minus 3. And that gives us 1,407 times 10 to the power 6. Uh, the force should be in, in newtons. So that will be our answer. So this, this, these questions were, um, or were a bit um, uh, I, I cannot say unusual, but uh, they were a bit hidden in the, in the sense that uh, you are given the stress in this case and you are given the area and you have to calculate that. So you need somehow to play with the formula, but I think we can avoid playing with the formula to make F the subject, but as long as we can be able to calculate the area. Remember, if you are given the diameter or the radius, then to calculate the area, you must use that formula. Area is equal to pi radius squared, depending on whether you have a if it's a diameter, then you, you know that you have either a cylindrical body with a cross-sectional area. So to find that cross-sectional area, you must use that formula. Basically, I think that is uh, what the question uh, required there. I, I think with that uh, a question or example, you can try uh, others, uh, learners, and see if you can be able to, to calculate. But the important thing for us is to try to, like we have done, write down the information that is provided. Think about um, what you have to calculate. Look at the appropriate formula that you have to use and then uh, um, um, see if you can be able to substitute. Don't, rem don't forget that you have to uh, convert uh, uh, the units to SI units. And I think that is the most important thing or the most important part in these calculations on elasticity and uh, Hooke's law. Um, yes, I think because the next one that we will be looking at is um, a section also on its own hydraulics. Maybe we can also take a short break, five minute break, and then we do that. And I think uh, we will be done for this particular session. 
Uh, welcome back, uh, learners. Uh, what we are going to deal with in this particular case is hydraulics, although in this section of the book it says viscosity and hydraulics, but we will uh, uh, focus more on hydraulics, although the two are, are related. Uh, I think viscosity you also have done something uh, about. So what we would expect you to to know by the end of this is that you should, we will not talk about viscosity as I've indicated, so we should um, understand, because hydraulics really has to do with forces um, uh, in, 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 in liquids, so we'll talk about, um, you should know something about the force called thrust which is uh, exerted by 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 uh, fluids or liquids, if you like, and then you have um, uh, to know something about pressure. We have already talked about pressure, but we have to apply it in 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 fluids or in liquids. And then we will talk about uh, Pascal's law. Uh, I I don't think we'll be able to uh, get to hydraulic lifts, but uh, Pascal's law uh, uses makes use or, or, or hydraulic lifts as well as things like um, a, a jacks in, in, in um, um, motors, those jacks that you use in motors to lift a, a, a heavy a car or, or a, a truck or whatever is, 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 is um, makes use of uh, Pascal's law. So we are going to see how some related um, uh, applications to hydraulic lifts, uh, to to jacks, and also, if you like, you can say hydraulic systems. Then we will see how these are used um, as a way to apply uh, Pascal's uh, law. So we will uh, I will scroll through uh, viscosity because it is not our. Uh, subject of discussion in, in this particular case, and then uh, look at hydraulics. Uh, hydraulics, as is referred to as fluid mechanics, is a topic applied in science and engineering dealing with mechanical properties of liquids. So hydraulic systems are extremely important to the operation of heavy equipment. So like I've indicated uh, in this case, uh, the use of jacks to lift heavy objects. Hydraulic principles are used when designing hydraulic systems, steering systems of a car, braking systems of the car, uh, power-assisted uh, steering and uh, powertrain systems, automatic transmissions, all this use hydraulic principles. Earth moving equipment like um, uh, uh, this um, Crane, do you call them cranes or crates that uh, 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 are used to to build our roads? Uh, they they use hydraulic systems a lot. So in hydraulic systems, forces, so the forces that are associated with 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 fluids re really are referred to as thrust that are exerted by liquid are transmitted to mechanical system. So a thrust is the normal force exerted by a liquid at rest on a given surface uh, in contact with it. So if you have a, a liquid in contact with a surface, the force exerted by that liquid on the surface is called a thrust. Um, the advantages of lo using liquids in hydraulic systems include uh, um, or are based on the fact that liquids conform to the shape of the container. So if you make a cylindrical uh, container, then a liquid will, will um, um, take the shape of that cylindrical uh, container. I think this is um, knowledge that you have from as uh, back far back as uh, primary. Liquids are generally incompressible. In other words, you, when, when you compress a liquid, the particles don't move uh, so much. 
close together as opposed to gases because in gases the spaces between the particles are much bigger. So this makes uh, liquids uh, more, uh, uh, they can be used easily in, in hydraulics. And then liquids exert pressure in all directions. This is another important uh, uh, property of liquids that uh, when you apply a force on a liquid, then that force is transmitted equally through the, 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 the liquid and in all directions, and that is important. So in hydraulic machines, exerting a small force over a small cross-sectional area can lead to pressure being transmitted, uh, creating a large force over a large cross area. This ability to multiply the size of the forces allows hydraulics to be used in many applications such as car braking systems. So you apply a force on a smaller area of, 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 of uh, a hydraulic system, the the pressure is taken to a, a bigger area and then uh, that uh, causes the, a small force that is applied on a smaller area to be magnified into a bigger force on a, a bigger uh, surface area or on a larger area and that is a very important principle in in the use of um, uh, jacks and all the other hydraulic systems which can be used to lift heavier objects using a small a small force. So it's, it's like some kind of a machine where you will use a small force to lift a bigger uh, uh, mass or a, a bigger object. Now this is why when a liquid is confined in a container, a force is exerted compressing the liquid the liquid will exert pressure on a container in all directions. This may result in, a con or result in a container breaking up in if the pressure is not channeled to doing some work. So we notice that pressure at a particular point is the thrust acting on the unit area around that point. So we already have of have the formula for pressure pressure is the force acting on a unit area so even in liquids or in fluids the pressure at a particular point is the thrust or the force uh, remember that we said that thrust is a normal force acting on a particular area or unit area around that point so the formula for pressure is still given uh, like that i think here we have to have a, a capital p where P is the pressure in pascals or newton per square meter and F is the thrust in newtons and A is the area in square meters. So in, 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 in simple terms, we're still, although we now we'll be looking at, 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 at fluids or liquids, we still use the same concepts of pressure where we are using P for pressure, we are using F for, for force in newtons and the area in square meters. So it's still basically the same thing that we have done earlier. Uh, an experimental observation uh, has been made that fluids can exert pressure in any direction and as a result a swimmer will feel the uh, pressure of water on all parts of their body at any point in the fluid at rest, the pressure is the same in all directions. This, this statement that um, at any point in a fluid at rest, the pressure is the same in all directions is a very important at a particular given depth. An example of pressure in the air that fills or is the air that fills an automobile tire. As the tire is inflated, more air is squeezed into it than can hold. The air inside the tire resists the squeezing by pushing outward on the casing of the tire. The outward push of the air, pre the outward push of the air is pressure. Equal pressure throughout is confined, or um, throughout a confined in the area is a characteristic of any pressurized fluid. And I think this is important that outward push of the air 
is, 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 is actually equal at all points in, in a container or in a, a confined area. And that is a, an important characteristic that we should uh, realize. And here they're giving an e e e e interesting example to say that in an inflated tire, the outward push of the air is uniform throughout. Just imagine if uh, the tire's pressure was not uniform, the tire would be pushed into all shapes because of its elasticity. So you wouldn't have a uniform, um, um, uh, can I say round tire, uh, because one part of the of the tire would be pushed more than the other. So the pressure inside the tire will be the same because of uh, the fluid. Uh, so that is important. Fluids exert pressure in or the same pressure or equal pressure throughout a confined um, area. The pressure can be in, in, uh, created by squeezing or pushing on a confined fluid only if there is a resistance to, to flow. The two ways to push on a liquid or fluid are by action of a mechanical pump or by the weight of the fluid. So uh, this one of the fluid also is important. Uh, we would really look at this, but we are told that a box weighs 500 newtons. Its base has an area of that. You have the base of uh, the area of the base what pressure does it exert? What is the area of the base required to produce twice the pressure? I think we can be able to do this problem. Uh, it's similar to that one of 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 um, um, a wire or a rod with a cross-sectional area. The difference here that is that the area is zero point five meters squared, but it's a square base for a box. Here, anyway, you don't have to multiply the length by the breadth. You are already given the area. You have the, uh, the weight. So the pressure is equal to the force divided by the area. And that is as simple as that. So I think this one is really uh, quite simple for us uh, to, to do. Now, it is important also to notice that you know, it goes back to those conversions. Um, there are other practical units of pressure, such as the atmosphere. Sometimes uh, you are told that uh, in atmospheric or atmospheric pressure, so uh, that is given as atmosphere, and that is equivalent to one comma. 0, 1, 3, 2, 5 times 10 to the power 5 pascals. So you, you can have a pressure of uh, in pascals or you can have it also in atmospheres. So there is a conversion factor. One atmosphere is equal to that. Therefore, one pascal will be 1 over uh, one atmosphere. And that is what we were trying to do uh, earlier on with our conversions. So if you 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 uh, can study, learn this, and know that if you want to convert bars into pascals or pascals into bars, this would be the conversion. One uh, bar is equal to one times ten to the power five pascals. So a bar is also another unit of um, um, pressure that you can. You also have a tor, which. Uh, uh, is equal to uh, 133 pascals. So the conversion factor also is there. You, you, you know, as long as you, you know the conversion factor between the units of uh, the pascals and atmosphere bar and tor, then you can be able to work with calculations involving pressure because you can be asked to calculate the pressure not in pascals but in atmospheres, especially when you have uh, fluids or um, gases. In this activity, I would also use the same advice that I ask you to do, you are asked to define the terms. Go through the definitions and practice uh, on your own 
and that would uh, help a lot. A fluid pressure. It 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 is um, also important to notice that a liquid on its own or a fluid on its own uh, exerts pressure, as we have already said that it exerts pressure in all uh, uh, or equal pressure in different directions. Now here we are led to some some formulae that will be useful in um, understanding especially uh, Pascal's uh, law. Uh, that if you have a cylinder or a tank, a cylindrical tank filled with fluid as shown in there, like water or any other fluid, the water inside the cylinder exerts a force at the bottom of the cylinder due to its weight. The water itself exerts a force. And the density of a substance is defined as the mass of a substance per unit volume. So the density is mass divided by a unit volume. There it is. And uh, the, the symbol for density is this uh, unit here, rho, that is given uh, uh, like a, a, a small p there. So it's mass divided by volume. So if you want to calculate the density, you divide the mass uh, by the volume of uh, uh, the liquid. The density is measured in kilograms per cubic meter. So this is a, as a unit of uh, density. The density of water at room temperature is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meters. So uh, this density of water at room temperature is given and you usually uh, uh, be given that uh, density depending on the, the situation or the question. But now if we are saying the density is equal to mass divided by volume, if we want the mass, uh, then you know, it's by that same cross multiplication that I have been uh, using that um, mass will be given by density times volume. And that is a formula if we want to uh, make mass at the subject of the formula. So given this, the force exerted by the water on the bottom of the container uh, here um, is the weight of the water. Remember, the, the weight is the mass divided by a, a, a gravitational a force or gravitational acceleration. Just depends on which way you would uh, use it, which is g. So f is equal to mg, which is the weight of uh, that object. But we have said in the place of mass m here, we have uh, density times volume. So the force exerted by a liquid can also be uh, uh, said to be the density multiplied by volume multiplied by the uh, gravitational force. We have defined pressure as the or gravitational acceleration if you want. The accel uh, the, we have defined pressure as the force applied per unit area. Therefore pressure is equal to force over area and therefore pressure is equal to, remember we said our force is equal to um, density times volume times g. So we have density times volume times g for force divided by area. But we also know that the volume equals to the area of the base times the perpendicular height. I think this is just a derivation of the formula. So the volume of a uh, liquid is equal to the area of the liquid or the base times the height or the perpendicular height. So the area of the base, that would be the, the volume of, uh, uh, of the liquid in the container here, will be the area of the base multiplied by that height. Therefore, uh, if we have that V is equal to A times H, area times height, in that formula where we have V, we substitute in A area times height. I think here we ought to have a small h. So uh, pressure is given by the density of the liquid multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. Uh, multiplied by 
the area multiplied by height. That is the area of the base. But we remember we said pressure is force divided by area. So you can see that the area cancels the area and therefore you have this pressure is equal to uh, density multiplied by g multiplied by height. And this is uh, the formula that can we can use to calculate the pressure of a given fluid or of a given liquid. This is known as the fluid pressure. The formula above is used to calculate the fluid pressure. So when we deal with fluids or with liquids, um, then that is the formula we use for pressure, which is the same formula that comes from pressure is equal to force over area. I think we could um, try to do this, this example quickly before we get to Pascal's uh, law. This one says calculate the fluid pressure on a scuba diver when the he she is 12 meters below the surface of the ocean. The density of the ocean water is that. So here you are given, uh, allow me to uh, use the same uh, approach as I used before. You are asked to calculate the liquid pressure or the fluid pressure. When you are given the that this scuba diver, a diver in, 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 in water or in the sea is about is, is twelve meters. So the distance or the height above the uh, the diver will be twelve meters. That is because he's 12 meters below the surface of the ocean. So the, the, the height above him from where he is to the surface of the water is 12 meters. And then the density of, of, of water or ocean water is 1,03 times 10 to the power 3 kilograms uh, per cubic meter. So the question simply says you should calculate the, the pressure of the liquid. So I will uh, switch on to the camera. I have written down that information. So you will notice here that the formula that we need to use is uh, the pressure of the fluid is equal to the density times G times height. But we know that G is a constant is eight is <laughs> it's nine comma eight uh, if you like you can say meters per second or in newtons per kilogram I think we can use it that way okay let me say it's meters per second squared that is the acceleration due to gravity as you know it um then you, you can see this one is just simple substitution, really. You have G, you have H, you have uh, density. So yours is just to plug in the, the numbers in there. Density is 1,03 times 10 to the power 3. Um, G is 9,8. And you multiply by the height, which is 12 meters above that. So this is how you would be able to calculate the fluid air pressure. You can work that out. I'm sure my calculator says it's one comma to one times ten to the power of five. But remember his pressure should be in in Pascals. Yeah, we can we can we can check. But basically this is how you would approach that question.
it's a straightforward question you have the formula that you have to apply uh, although you are given the height and the density of the water remember that for fluid pressure or liquid pressure you have to have the density because it's force and the density multiplied by g and 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 you multiply by height so here g is not given but it's a constant that you will get in your in your uh, data sheet and you can be able to to calculate that fluid pressure please excuse me if i uh, got this one the other way but i think it should be uh, that way I think you'll check it. You'll check. Um, I I think it will be uh, the way I got it there. Remember that we we are humans. We make we are human. We make mistakes. Yes, it's one comma two one times ten to the power five. So um, we can do other activities. Um, I think you can do that, but the basic idea is that uh, you need to look at that relationship. I think that is the important relationship. A pressure in a fluid is equal to den density times uh, G times height, and this height is the height um, below the, the the fluid surface. Uh, that will take us to Pascal's law. Now. Um, as we said, pressure is defined as a force per unit uh, area. Now the question is that can pressure be increased in a fluid by pushing directly on the fluid? And the answer is yes, you can increase the pressure uh, uh, by pushing on the fluid. But it's much easier if the fluid is enclosed. So if you have an enclosed fluid, which is what um, uh, actually the principle of a um, uh, hydraulic system is, you have an enclosed fluid. And this was first recognized by uh, Pascal and is called Pascal's principle or Pascal's law. According to Pascal, he says that in a continuous liquid at equilibrium, the pressure applied at any point is transmitted equally to other parts of the liquid. So if you have a continuous column of liquid in equilibrium or at equilibrium, the pressure that is applied at any particular point is transmitted equally to all the other parts of the liquid. So the pressure is transmitted equally. So please learn that Pascal's law and be able to apply it. You, as I said, you will be able to get the, this the definition in, in your terms and definitions <coughs> and it is important for you to, to know that. So since atoms in a fluid are free to move, they transmit the pressure to all parts of the fluid and to the walls of the container. And remarkably, the pressure is transmitted undiminished. So the pressure that you apply at any particular point, it will move uniformly to all the other parts of, 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 of the container because or it's, 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 it, it will move undiminished. In other words, it does not decrease in, in magnitude. It does not increase in magnitude. This is the experiment that uh, perhaps I wouldn't uh, want uh, us to do. So the, uh, one of the uh, uh, important applications of Pascal's law is found to in hydraulic systems, which is an enclosed fluid system used to exert forces. And this is an example that we use for a, a hydraulic jack, for example. 
um, and other hydraulic systems, the hydraulic system uh, uh, lifts and uh, also the dentist chairs, you will uh, uh, remember all this. But a typical hydraulic system has two filled, fluid filled cylinders kept with pistons. So you have a, 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 a cylinder there, a cylinder there, these are enclosed. So in one of these cylinders has a piston a, or a smaller piston and the other one or the other cylinder is bigger, has a, a wider diameter than the, the, the other and then it has a bigger piston. And here we are talking in terms of area. The area of the other piston is a, bigger than the area of the, the, the one. So when you apply a force on the, the smaller area, then the pressure exerted on that piston or on the liquid is transmitted to all parts of, of the system and that pressure uh, is transmitted to the bigger, uh, uh, to the bigger uh, piston with a bigger area. Now, uh, here is uh, an, an explanation. According to Pascal's pr principle, the pressure is transmitted through a liquid to a large piston of area A or if a downward force F1 is applied to a smaller pole, uh, piston A, A1, then uh, that pressure, according to Pascal's law, is transmitted through a fluid to a large piston of area A2. As the pistons move and the fluids in the left and right cylinder change their relative heights, there are slight differences in the pressure of the input and the output pistons. Neglecting the small differences, the fluid pressure in each of the pistons may be taken the same. From the definition of pressure, we get the following formula. Remember, the pressure on this uh, will be uh, the force applied on that piston. So that is the pressure on this liquid. The force applied on that piston divided by the area of the piston. So if this is cylindrical, you already know that uh, to calculate the area, you need to know the 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 diameter or the radius of that piston, cross sectional diameter, cross the sectional uh, 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 radius. Then, um, from the definition, the pressure or of pressure, we get the following: the pressure uh, on piston one will be equal to the pressure on piston two. So, force on piston two divided by area of that piston or cross-sectional area of that piston. And this equation relates to the ratios of force to an area in an hydraulic system, providing the pistons are at the same level or same vertical height, and that friction is in the system is negligible. Therefore, the magnitude of F2 is larger than the magnitude of F1 by a factor A2 over A1. That is why the large load or a large load can be moved on a large piston by a much smaller force on the smaller piston. So the, the, the idea here is that um, a hydraulic system can be used to apply a smaller force on the smaller piston and get a larger amplified force on a larger uh, 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 piston and therefore magnifying or amplifying the the, the output force, hence why it is easy for you to uh, lift a heavy object uh, by using a hydraulic system. Perhaps you can look at this one and, 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 and many others that, that, that follow, but um, uh, we will just look at that example and, and see uh, if we can be able to, to to work it out. Assume on a hydraulic press, a 220 Newton force is applied to the small piston of the surface. So you have um, you have okay that system where you have um, 
a 220 newton force applied to the small piston. I wanted to, to draw this, but let's call that small piston F1, um, small, the force applied on the small piston F1, and we call it 200, where we give it uh, the magnitude of 220 newtons. And um, the surface area of that uh, small piston, which is A1, will be 0 0.12 uh, square meters. Now they say if the surface area of the large piston, so the large piston, let's call that A2, will have an area of 3 square meters. What total force is exerted, exerted on the larger uh, uh, piston? So F2 will be what? I think this will also be a straightforward uh, question. So if you look back at that diagram that we, 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 we showed, where you have a smaller piston and a, a bigger piston, and we say the smaller one, the f a force of that one on a smaller one, which we call F1, is equal to 220 newtons. The area of that piston is 0 0.12 square meters, and the area of the larger um, piston is 3 square meters. How much force would you get on, on, on that larger piston? So you, you can see this really uh, makes use of uh, Pascal's law, where you would say that F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. But you already have A2, you have F1 and A1, so the only one that you have to calculate is, is F2. So it may be easier for you just to substitute in the numbers in the, in the formula. So for F1, you have 220 over the area, which is 0 0,12. And then you have F2 over the area, which is 3 square meters. And then you just calculate F2 by cross-multiplication. So you are going to have 3 times 220 divided by 0 0,12. And that would be the force in newtons that you would have on the larger piston. Maybe we will just um, see that it, it actually makes sense. The way I look at it, it gives 5, 5, times 10 to the power 4 newtons. So if you like, that would be 5, 5, and then you add, I think, 3 zeros. If you put here, one, two, three, four. Yes, I think it will be something like that. So you can see from the 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 force F two from you apply a force of two twenty newtons on the smaller uh, on the smaller piston, but the la larger piston gives you a, a magnitude of five point five times ten to the power four newtons. So it 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 produces a huge force. You can lift very heavy objects with that force. And that is the importance of uh, Pascal's, uh, Pascal's uh, law, to say that the relationship between the, the force and area on one piston is, 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 uh, is such that uh, the ratio F1 over a1 is equal to the ratio F2 over A2 uh, if you have an enclosed liquid in 
that is not uh, uh, flowing in equilibrium, and that is the, the application there. So we can use um, different, different, different um, examples to work out this, but the principle in Pascal's law is that Um, the, the 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 principle is 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 that I don't know. Oh, I think I made I made a mistake here. I'm trying to check now where I made a mistake. Three um, times two twenty. I think I I added another zero divided by zero comma one two. I made zero comma zero one two instead of zero comma one two. So this would be three, and then we cancel the other zero there. But that's that's a mistake that I made. So the 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 idea here is that you can use a small force on one of the pistons to obtain a bigger force on the other end, and therefore you can magnify or amplify the forces that you are applying, and that's basically a Pascal's law. And, 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 and we can try um, various other uh, questions just to see uh, how this um, uh, Pascal's law is, is applied. But I think um, that is as far as uh, we can go um, uh, with, 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 with uh, Pascal's law and that application. I think also you can check there could also be a challenge with this uh, answer here. You know, like I did make a mistake, divide by 0, 0,012 instead of 0, 0,12. So you can also check that, but I, I think it should be 5,5 .5 times 10 to the power 3. So, so, so you can do other uh, problems uh, uh, using uh, Pascal's law and 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 see if you can be able to 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 do these calculations remember for for definitions you have to know those definitions and one way you can do that is by trying and write them down on your own then compare your answers with what you have in the terms and definitions uh, Lenas, i think uh, i may not solve all the problems i may not do all the examples but um, I think working together and trying to revise together uh, uh, sort of adds some something to whatever knowledge you already have. Uh, I think that uh, will assist you towards the end of the year examinations. And with that, I want to say I want to wish you all the best in your examinations and in, 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 in your future interactions with the subject, as some of you will actually carry it um, along with them to higher institutions, to their workplace, etc., etc., to make sure that uh, the subject uh, uh, is used meaningfully in their lives. And with this, I think we will be coming to the end of this session. And thank you very much and good luck.